Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, thoracic imaging number five. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and you can pause to study the images further if you'd like. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one, CT chest with contrast. Okay, so we've got four images of the lower lungs here, and you can see that there's a well-circumscribed rounded nodule pleural based within the right lower lobe. And it's primarily soft tissue density, but if you look closely, you can see that there are areas of fat density here, and that corresponds to the same density as you see here in the subcutaneous fat. If we were to put a region of interest on this area, we'd get a density of negative 30 Hounsfeld units or less. And then also notice on this lower right-hand image, there's some small areas of coarse calcification. So this is classic for a benign pulmonary hemorrhoma. So these are neoplasms that are a mixture of connective tissue, muscle, fat, bone, and even cartilage. It sounds kind of like a hot dog, doesn't it? <laughs> and it's one of the most common benign tumors of the lung, accounting for about 8% of all neoplasms. So about 60% of these will have fat, and up to 30% will have this calcification. So the problem comes when you don't really see the fat, which can occur in 40% of these nodules. And sometimes getting thin section CT images reconned of the nodule will help you detect small areas of intralesional fat. Also, this calcification is sometimes described as popcorn-like. So if you have a well-circumscribed mass here like this that's been stable over time and has fat in it, that's virtually pathognomonic for pulmonary hematoma. There are some less common causes of fat-containing pulmonary nodules, like you can have uh, pulmonary lipomas that are just pure fat. Also, lipoid pneumonia when patients aspirate a fat-containing substance. Very rarely you can have metastatic disease that has fat-containing nodules like liposarcoma or renal cell carcinoma, but you'll find a primary malignancy typically in those cases, and those nodules will be increasing and usually multiple. All right, case two, topogram from a CT chest, history of chest pain. Slide two of two, here's the CT chest with contrast. All right, so starting with this topogram, we see that the mediastinum is widened, and there's prominence in the hilar regions, and we kind of lose the normal mediastinal contour. Everything seems expanded. So you might worry about an aortic dissection or aneurysm, but diffuse lymphadenopathy can also give this appearance. And on the chest CT, we see that there is a huge anterior mediastinal mass that's completely encasing the great vessels as they come off the aortic arch, and it's also encasing part of the aortic arch here in the ascending thoracic aorta. Also notice the superior vena cava is extremely narrowed, and the right pulmonary artery is also encased and narrowed. So if you've seen the previous lectures, I mentioned before the five T's for an enterosuperior mediastinal mass as far as coming up with a differential diagnosis. So it could be thymus, like a thymic cyst, thymoma, thymic carcinoma, or a thymolipoma. It could be thyroid in origin, like a goiter or thyroid cancer. You always want to remember a thoracic aorta. It could be an aneurysm. And then teratoma in germ cell tumors. And then even though there's no T, a terrible lymphoma. So this is typical for mediastinal lymphoma. And in this case, it was Hodgkin lymphoma. So clues that it's lymphoma is it's very confluent. You don't see discrete nodules or lymphadenopathy. It's all become one large conglomerate mass. And also, it's homogeneously isodense to skeletal muscle, which is a typical feature for lymphoma. Sometimes it can be heterogeneous and rarely even necrotic, but this is the most classic appearance. And also, lymphoma tends to compress and encase structures, but doesn't actually occlude them. So you can see the superior vena cava is extremely narrowed here, but remains patent. Also, the right bronchus is narrowed, but remains patent. And then you'll typically see lymphadenopathy elsewhere when you have a lymphoma, as opposed to other anterosuperior mediastinal masses. So here the lymphadenopathy is conglomerate. It extends throughout all the nodal stations in the mediastinum that we can see on these images, including the subcranial region. So lymphoma is typically treated with chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and depending on the type, it has variable response. Early stage Hodgkin lymphoma actually has the best prognosis, and in this case, you could see a follow-up CT scan six months later shows a dramatic decrease in this anterior mediastinal mass. There's only a small amount of residual anterior tumor, and you can see that the right pulmonary artery there looks much more normal compared to the compressed appearance we saw in the pretreatment images. Okay, case three, multiple CT images from the upper thoracic inlet. Slide two of two with comparison CT scan six months prior.
Okay, so this left-hand upper image shows the trachea with lung windows, and when you see that there's a non-dependent filling defect within the trachea, and this does not look typical for mucus and secretions. It's somewhat polypoid, and it's non-dependent, and it has no gas within it. And on soft tissue windows, we do see it has somewhat of a soft tissue density. Mucus will tend to be more of a dependent phenomenon that will have little foci of gas in it from secretions. And then if we look at the sagittal and coronal reformatted images, it confirms that this is a polypoid lesion. It has angular margins with the adjacent trachea, and again has that soft tissue density. And our suspicion is confirmed when we compare to the prior study, and this has increased quite a bit in size compared to that study, and it remains non-dependent. So this turned out to be tracheal squamous cell carcinoma. So primary tracheal and nebronchial tumors are not very common, but they are usually malignant, and the most common of those is squamous cell carcinoma, usually seen in patients with a prior smoking history. So that's why it's a good idea to get a follow-up study when you see a non-dependent intraluminal lesion, unless it has gas within it, because you can have adherent mucus, but that should have gas within it and shouldn't have a polypoid appearance. And then other types of primary endobronchial malignancies that you can have are adenocarcinoma and small cell carcinoma. Carcinoid is another one to remember that tends to be endobronchial. And then you can also have salivary gland origin endobronchial tumors like mucoepidermoid and adenoid cystic carcinoma. Don't forget about endobronchial metastases, which are not primary, but you can see in the setting of melanoma or renal cell carcinoma, among others. All right, case four, non-contrast CT of the chest history of scleroderma. Slide two of two coronally formatted images. All right, so I give you a clue here with the history of scleroderma, and there's a large pericardial effusion here on this right-hand lower image, which is a typical finding in scleroderma patients seen in greater than 40%. And then if we look at the lung windows, you can see that there is extensive traction bronchiectasis here in the right middle lobe, that's dilated bronchi, and also in the lower lobe bilaterally. In addition, you can see that there's macrocystic honeycombing. So we have these cystic spaces all along the periphery of the lung at the bases here. And then we also have subpleural reticular opacities here as well, noted bilaterally. Notice that we don't really have any subpleural sparing. And there are some faint ground glass opacities, but that's not a dominant finding. The dominant findings are these fibrotic changes. Then if we look further at these coronal reformatted images, you can see that these fibrotic changes of basal traction bronchiectasis and macrocystic honeycombing with subpleural reticulation has no real apical correlation. So there's an apical basilar gradient. It's predominantly a basilar finding. So this is diagnostic of usual interstitial pneumonia or UIP. So this is a pattern of chronic interstitial lung disease that's typically seen in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But that's a diagnosis of exclusion. And when you see UIP, it's just a histologic pattern that could also be due to underlying systemic diseases. So typically that would include connective tissue disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, like in this case, polymyositis and dermatomyositis, and then mixed connective tissue disease. You can also have drug toxicity that can give you this appearance, like amiodarone lung, patients who've received bleomycin or methotrexate, and also patients who have asbestosis. That can give you an asbestosis-related interstitial lung disease. And in this case, the patient has a known history of scleroderma. And the imaging appearance when you have this classic UIP pattern is so specific it can preclude the need for a biopsy. So that's why it's important to be aware of these findings. All right, last case, history of tricuspid endocarditis, chest x-ray. Slide two of two, CT chest. Okay, so this chest x-ray shows multiple vague patchy nodular densities throughout the lung. And you can see some of them actually have some central cavitation there, but it's difficult to see. Also, the patient has a right pick line, which tells you that they're getting long-term intravenous therapy for something. The patient also had a CT chest, and on these lung windows, you can see that there are numerous cavitating pulmonary nodules of varying size. Most of them are small to medium-sized, and they have a fairly thin wall, although some are a little thickened and irregular. And in a patient with a history of tricuspid endocarditis, this is typical for septic emboli. So tricuspid endocarditis is the most common cause of these emboli in IV drug users, but other causes like an infected DVT or thrombophlebitis and infected catheters and lines can lead to septic emboli. And the agent is usually Staph aureus or Streptococcus. And it's common to see this cavitation here, but you might see varying stages of cavitation. So we also have some nodules here that have not yet cavitated. You might also see a feeding vessel sign where you see the pulmonary artery leading up to the nodule, which we see here 
with a few of the nodules. And again, that's because of the bacteremia as the origin leading to these emboli. So what should your differential diagnosis be when you see multiple small to medium-sized cavitary lung lesions? So septic emboli should definitely be on your list, but rheumatoid nodules, which are known as necrobiotic nodules, can sometimes cavitate. Also, cavitating pulmonary metastases, typically from squamous cell carcinoma or transitional cell urothelial metastases. And then also granulomatosis with polyangiitis, which is a vasculitis formerly known as Wegener granulomatosis that often has cavitary nodules. All right, I'm sorry to say goodbye, but that's it for five cases in five minutes, thoracic imaging number five. I really hope that you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be legendary if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also leave a comment or a question on YouTube, and I'll do my best to answer it. Visit us at RadiologistHQ.com for more info and to follow us on social media to get updates. Thanks, and have a great day. Mm -hmm.